Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with George. George, please introduce yourself for everyone out there listening who do, might not know who you are, because um, we have a lot to talk about. I'm super excited for this. I am too, Robbie. It's good to meet you. Yeah, I'm um, George Howard in Raleigh, North Carolina, aka The Cosmic Tusk is my online name and also the name of my, my, my blog. And uh, that relates to some of the subjects that we'll be talking about. And I am an independent researcher that uh, became involved 25 years ago with um, a cataclysm that we believe happened uh, roughly 13,000 years ago that we're going to discuss in some detail today and have been working on it for years and years. And I don't know, I guess about 10, 15 years into it, I got in touch with um, real scientists. Uh, I can barely say that I'm a scientist. Some of the actual credentialed scientists say, George, no, you qualify. You don't have to have credentials, but I've never felt comfortable saying that. So uh, I say I'm an avocational scientist. So I'm a pajama scientist, like maybe a lot of people that are listening to you now, but uh, I was very fortunate to get hooked up with the credentialed scientists. So I've published uh, numerous papers as a co-author with them. And those papers have been very, very popular. Actually, um, some of the most read scientific papers on earth. Now, perhaps not the most widely understood, and the subject we're talking about might be entirely new to people, but within scientific circles, it's been very, very active, and I think will be of interest to people. I always find that independent researchers are just people who are really passionate about a certain topic or maybe an understanding of something are the people I prefer to talk to over uh, maybe an institutional scientist. I know people go, well, the PhD kind of means a lot. I'm like, not really in a sense, because it also, it's a major restriction in my mind. My whole, I guess, abstract of academia has really changed after talking to so many of them and realizing that you're going to be passionate about the thing you're interested in, but an institution giving you funding or telling you what you can or what's going to be likely, I guess, qualifying for being a paper or something, it just, you lose an aspect to it. A person like I, I've seen the Cosmic Tusk, and I actually have their website um, on here as well, too, to pull up. And it's thoroughly done. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, like I was telling you off air, it has a lot of like incredible like evidence and a lot of reporting and a lot of writing as well. And it's like you put time and care into it. Um, it's just the issue is that a lot of people, there's so much information out there. It's hard for everyone to soak in. And one that I've been getting super interested in, hopefully I say it right, is the younger dryer impact hypothesis, which is dry like, us. Dry. I knew I was going to get it wrong. Dry us, kind of like if it was US, but it's actually AS. So it's dry us. But like that's dry fine. It's an entirely new term to anyone but you know what that makes it very googleable it's if you kinda, type in younger dry ice, you're not going to get confused <laughs> with other subjects it's kind of it's kind of like dry ice you just got to put a little mustard on it <laughs> yeah, um, that's right yeah the younger dry ice. but it, it's an extinction event and i've i've talked about it in like kind of in depth a little bit but it was very hard because when a, it, it's it's hard to make the information soak in especially to the general public and i find for myself only because it has to not be speeched at it kind of has to be talked through and for me i find if i have questions i might as well ask the people who do, it doesn't you don't have to have a degree saying yes you qualify for this but if you're passionate about it i find that i can really get interested in something that you're interested in and that's kind of how i base this show and that's why i wanted to invite you on as well too because i didn't even know um when I was listening to Randall Carlson's episode after we had already booked this, I heard your name get mentioned. I was like, wait a minute. Is that the same? And I look and I was like, oh, wait, that's the same exact person. And I was like, OK, so you're obviously going to be very well versed in this whole entire topic as well, too. And um, I, I would like it, at least for people listening now who might have not catched my previous episode um, about it. Could you just give everyone a brief description about the younger dry S mm -hmm. hypothesis? Well, uh, most of my family and friends would chuckle if they heard that because I'm not very good at brief descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> but the wonderful thing is we have some time here. So I'll give the thumbnail and then we can get into whatever I miss and I'll try not to elaborate too much. But the Younger Dryas, first of all, is a well-accepted cold period in geologically recent Earth history. 
Okay, so there's some parts of this that are unaccepted by the mainstream, if you will, or at least very controversial. And then there are other parts of it that are well accepted, but those remain a mystery, which we are trying to solve and resolve. Um, that cold period began uh, 12,880 some years ago, in my estimation. Some people prefer, prefer 870 or 850. Sometimes you'll see um, uh, uh, 12,900 or whatnot. But during that band of about somewhere within a, 100 years, uh, the northern hemisphere's temperatures plummeted dramatically. Uh, much more dramatically than in uh, in the immediate preceding times. And they stayed there for 1,200 years. So we went into a long, dark, cold, miserable winter, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. There were um, uh, problems in the Southern, Southern Hemisphere as well, but we'll get to those. Um, and that's an interesting time. So that's well accepted. And you might remember, I might be a little young, but I guess 20 years ago or so, there was a movie, uh, 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 The Day After, that discuss, the, the, whose premise was that the, the Gulf Stream shut down in modern times, and we were plunged into cold and the Statue of Liberty freezes and all of that. Well, that was based off of real science. And then Al Gore's presentations and any kind of abrupt global warming discussions, they'll always use the Younger Dryas as an example of the Earth's climate going wild instantly and how quickly it could change and suggesting that it could go the other way as well and we could get warmer. That uh, as Wally Broker, who was the, the lead scientist on this for many years, passed away a couple of years ago, but a very eminent scientist, he called it uh, that we might be poking the beast of climate and that that could result in something like the Younger Dryas, but probably to the warming. So they accepted the fact that, um, well accepted, that you have this mysterious period only 13,000 or so years ago where the temperatures plunged over 20 degrees Fahrenheit instantly and stayed there and the glaciers readvanced. Strangely enough, it was actually, to some people's estimation, a little bit even warmer than it is today, right? Or at least around where it is today. But the glacier sheets from the previous or the, the glacial period we were entering still reach down into um, uh, uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania and, you know, the northern United States were still covered in an ice sheet two miles thick at a time where the climate wasn't much different than it is today, but the ice sheet was melting. So then the Younger Dryas, when, when, when that kicked in, the glaciers re-advanced again for 1,200 years. So it kicked us into back into the ice age for 1,200 years, and then just as rapidly, it, we snap out of it. Like literally, the sun rose one day and the climate returned almost, right? And the question is, what caused that 1,200-year period? But there were other things happening at the time that were... <laughs> mysterious to say the least, that have always been considered mysteries and worthy of scientific debate. And we brought a, 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 a new aspect to this. But um, the megafauna in uh, the Northern Hemisphere and particularly the, the um, North American continent disappeared. And megafauna being uh, all mammals over 50 kilograms, I think. And that included a whole variety of beasts that we're familiar with from the movie Ice Age and other places like that. But the woolly mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger, the giant ground sloth. We have one downtown in our museum here that must be 15, 20 feet high. Um, all sorts of odd things like uh, 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 armadillos, the size of Volkswagens, you know, beavers, the size of Suburbans, things that are still around but were much, much larger in size. The uh, American continent looked look much like the African savanna on steroids before mm -hmm. the Younger Dryas. You had uh, uh, cave lions, cave bears, much larger than current bears, just horrible, horrible beasts. Um, and they all go extinct at that time. Not instantly, but instantly, certainly in a geological sense and in a timeline sense, it's pretty instantaneous that, that millions and millions of mammals uh, blink out in a relatively short time. And we still find the bones, you know, I have a search for mammoth tusk on Google alerts. And I bet you once a week, somebody goes and finds 
some portion or whatnot of a mammoth tusk, right? That's because they're buried shallow. Okay, other things that happened then. Um, there were, uh, we, we believe, vast floods, but let's stick to what's accepted. Uh, the Clovis people disappear. And that was long regarded as the first American Indian culture right? The first paleo Indians. And they are, I do not have one here. I have them both, uh, have two reproduction Clovis points, but they're, uh, uh, that, 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 that period is defined by the discovery for many, many years now of a very special Indian spear point, if you will. I guess you could call it an arrowhead as well, but it's a long, um, lithic and it's hafted you may have seen they're beautiful go like that and then at the bottom you know there's a notch out the bottom yeah. and they look the same from seattle to miami to south america and there was a hunter gatherer culture that used or I'm not sure if you call it a culture but a hunter gatherers at the time that, that used that spear point all across north and south america and by some estimations, all of that flourished within a couple of hundred years prior to the Younger Dryas. And the idea was that those Indians came down through Beringia, the connection with Russia. And of course, that's been uh, argued about now, and we don't need to get all into all that. Maybe they came by the coast. Maybe there was some involvement from Europe. Who knows? But it is well accepted that we were populated by this paleo Indian, and then boom, they disappear. Okay. So you have people disappearing, animals disappearing, and a tremendous global shock into cold, right? Particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. So the question is, what caused that? And the traditional explanations uh, are overkill, right? Overchill and overill. <laughs> overkill was, and that relates more to the mammals disappearing, that that those hunters that coincide with the end of those Indians um, were such prolific hunters, they managed to hunt every single one of those beasts down within a period of two or 300 years. That the extinction was caused purely by humans. Um, another one is that it was the climate itself, that it became so cold that it shocked those animals and their ecosystems and they died out subsequently. And then there's a little bit more of a niche explanation that maybe there was disease that wiped out all those animals. So particularly whether it was climate or people that did it, that is a mainstream scientific debate that is considered one of the greatest mysteries. Um, and we think we bring something new to that debate that's very significant. And that's a cosmic impact. But... Uh... Before we get into the cosmic sure. impact, the overkill part, it, th does that not just seem a little bit too far-fetched to think that they killed and hunted every single mammal as well, too? And then how would they explain the also the other um, Indian people that also died as well, too? They can't hunt each other, even from different parts of the globe. It just kind of seems like it would be ridiculous. I mean, Geraint Windex or whatever can only kill 99.9. .9. You're not killing that point one. So to think that there was a theory that you killed every single mammal. Now, the, the ill part, the one where you talk about like maybe yeah. it's a flu or disease, that's yeah. going to be very attractive to a lot of people who just spent the past two and a half years locked inside of their home because of. Yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that also seems a little bit crazy, too. But if you look at the climate thing, a lot of what we're seeing now, for instance, in my town, I'm in Maryland on the East coast. It went from yeah. like 60 one day and then the next day it was 20 something. And then right now we're at 37 and there's just these highs and these drops and these overall, like, like I, snow out of nowhere. Basically we had, I think a record snow thing of like eight inches or something, which is a lot for the East coast. We're right by water. So we barely get any snow as it is. It's a rare occasion. Um, right. even when it rains, people still slow down when they drive. It's insane. Uh, but 
to me, I, I brought up the idea that a pole shift or something that's being able to explain like this whole entire flip and fluctuation in yeah. environmental things that was kind of rejected a little bit. But I look at it like if you're a scientist or anything, my issue and why I think I find this uh, theory or hypothesis so attractive is because there hasn't been a lot of people besides yourself and others that are working towards this goal. Other scientists just largely reject it. And I go, as a scientist, it just doesn't seem reasonable as as a person who's looking for, I mean, knowing that science, new evidence always comes out. There's a reason why you keep learning. You always learn something new. Something gets rejected a couple of years later because it doesn't work anymore. And it's a, you find something more attractive or something that best fits the narrative of whatever you're trying to figure out. Why right. would they reject it and be an overall onslaught on top of it? And the only thing I could think of was that academia is very competitive, especially if you're trying to get your name published under something, but also- right the whole evidence thing is what we're talking about is like, I don't know how to explain this. And if there's no type of thing where we get into the cosmic thing that you were about to mention, that's an explanation in its own as well too. But for some reason, I don't understand how they could think it would be an overkill um, in a, a disease type situation mm -hmm. or anything that wouldn't happen to do with a giant ter I guess, giant planetary kind of interaction in a sense to wipe mm -hmm. out everything. And I think what might've raised a lot of people's awareness in it, and this is like the perfect time to talk about this theory is that Snowpiercer, everyone saw that movie. I mean, to think that the earth doesn't have these fluctuations in environment where one day the whole climate is shifted into another thing. I mean, people want to think it's a warming. I honestly think that's a piece of it, but I also think that the earth has a reset balance to it or has right. these periods in time that it just decides, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be negative 40 degrees just because right. it can. It's a giant thing that we barely understand because we're more interested in space than we are in earth. And in some cases, sure. But I look at it like, is it so out of the realm of possibility that that person that goes to the store every single day at the same exact time decides to be like, oh, maybe I'm not going to go to the store today. Right. If you can expect that out of a person. Why can't you expect that our planet one day is not going to be exactly the same as it was before? But the only criticisms I can see besides scientists or people that just want to get their name in a book will be people who are pro global warming, as in saying that yeah. it's definitely global warming causing it, not a freezing or not some type of event like that. I mean, unless you got records of the earth heating up and everything turning into the Sahara desert and then life growing back, which seems more unlikely than it just freezing. Yeah. Then you, it, it wouldn't make, you know what I mean? Am I making sense in saying that? No, 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 it does. And there's a lot in what you're saying and, and we can discuss it um, fully if you like, but the, the, the global warming narrative, I think has had a, a, a very negative effect on the study of the younger Dryas impact. Right. In that, first of all, it undermines, like I said, it was even in Al Gore's presentation, and he doesn't get deeply into it. He'd probably bore people too much, but it's well accepted that there was this cold snap. If you don't accept a cosmic impact, you believe that the Earth's climate can have wild swings as a closed system itself, that, like you said, it just decides to do something for a mysterious reason, or it's naturally unstable. Well, it is naturally unstable, but why would it have certain lurches one way or another? And we add something to that, but it, but it, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't lend itself to further fear mongering uh, with regard to abrupt climate change. And that's that we're not a closed system, that the Earth's climate, it sometimes makes big lurches as a result of influence from outside of the Earth, from our solar system, right, from space, that they're incoming objects from time to time that are actually can be clustered in time, both on narrow timescales and large timescales, um, where we have uh, incoming swarms and fragments of comet debris. And that that leads to the dramatic changes in the past, or particularly the younger dryas, right? So that's kind of an inconvenient truth, if you will, <laughs> we believe. And it undermines the global warming thing a bit. And I've sometimes said, that the argument that we're in, the global argument over global warming, such that it is, it is certainly one side has been told to keep quiet, but <clears throat> is a little bit like a couple arguing about what's on the radio station in the car while the car is sitting on the train tracks. It might be really important to decide what to put on the radio station at the moment between you and your spouse, right? 
But if you're sitting on the train tracks, you've got bigger things to worry about. Or well, you should at least keep an eye on it. You should be looking at things that are going to affect future generations, even hundreds and hundreds of years from now, not just something right. that looks at the aspect of protecting your kids. That That's the weird thing is that in a grand scale, like I look at this, like, global warming, I would say as a build up upon build up upon build up, but it's a change that we can see. And it's a change that we can notice that we are affecting it as well, too. But what about like the random possibility that there might be an asteroid that just comes in from outer space and hits us? I've always said the every second that we like are alive right now is mm -hmm. luck because something could just come into our atmosphere and it could be a giant comet and it could be too late for us to stop it. I mean, I, I'm a big push for planetary defense. Um, I've Good. talked to plenty of people who study like exoplanets and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, but if you look up like how many comets have actually like, come close to hitting us, but something has pulled it away, like there's a mm -hmm. large scale, but nobody thinks about that. It's kind of like breathing. Like you don't yeah. think to breathe, you kind of just do. And then everything functions. I mean, bills are on most people's minds most of the time. Um, but for me, that's something that's more important than I say, like maybe switching over to electric cars or doing all these other types of things. But sadly, people can't get over the thing that they can see. And the thing that they can see is that when they go outside, the weather has changed. But what are they going to yeah. see on the news is that, oh, it's your car that's producing these things, or it's a cow burp that's doing this type of thing. In a sense, I'm pretty sure they probably play a scale. I'm not saying that they don't. But I think that there's something bigger out there. And I'm mm -hmm. curious to why there would be so much of a dismissal upon that, even if it's based in just getting your name in a book, or even if it's a narrative that's being spun, because I, I, I start to question more about people. And that's why I like talking to them and getting their own perspective on things as well, too, because it helps mm -hmm. me understand coming from that person when I can really truly understand your perspective through the information that you found through everything that you've seen. But yeah, you would think that we're an evidence based society. But who's to say we haven't found all the evidence yet? Well, Kyle, um, Kyle, excuse me, Robbie, those are good questions. Okay. And I didn't um, answer you as fully as I'd like with regard to why does mainstream science uh, reject this or why does it remain so controversial? And there are actually very, very vocal opponents to it that are motivated by something that's outside normal scientific dialogue, right? We have a gang of people that, that, that um, harass this theory constantly. OK, uh, both online and I guess somewhat to their credit in published papers that have been identified to be very, very flawed. But again, why is there so much pushback? Well, I mentioned one part of it that I think it gets to the global warming debate and undermines some of that. And I'll uh, I'll add to that just a bit that I believe those people think there's only so much fear space in the public mind. And that's probably true. And that you if the concern about global warming is so intense, we need not distract people from it by discovering, uh, discussing or debating or even accepting what may be something that takes from that fear space and creates something else that we're fearful of. Um, but then there's a whole larger dynamic within science that is the um, catastrophism versus uniformitarianism debate such that it, uh, that it is. And this goes back, since the origins of, right back to the origins of modern science. And the early debates uh, in, uh, you know, uh, 17th century and 18th century Europe about what caused the most recent extinctions and what caused dramatic geological evidence that there was sudden change. At that point, they didn't know how far back, but they knew it was relatively recent. And there were two camps, roughly, that still exist today in varying degrees of strength. Um, you would say some are catastrophists that believe that there's sudden changes that happened, and that was relegated to the world of religion two or 300 years ago. And it was very closely tied to religion because Christians at the time believed there was a tremendous cataclysm in the past and we called it the flood, right? Mm -hmm. So as we began to question our faith in the book, and that might be quite legitimate, it led to a lot of good things and a lot of things were discovered when we started um, using empirical science rather than received wisdom. Um, so, at that time, they started to question their, their, you know, their religious dogmas and faiths and said that part of that was the idea that there were catastrophes. 
And what came along then with, um, I think it's Charles Lyle, was that, no, there's a, the other way to look at it is uniformitarianism. And that all the geological changes we see in, in various um, earth features around us were all created slowly by uh, processes that we can see underway today, right? Erosion, wind, floodwaters of normal scale that happened many, many times. Look at the Grand Canyon that that was, and it may well have been dug over millions and millions and millions of years, grain by grain by grain, with no catastrophic events. But what happened, Robbie, was we, we, we tossed away the fact that there were cataclysms in the past that seemed just to the eye, to the layman, to demand something that we're not seeing today, right? And those are the catastrophists. And that's what I am. I'm a catastrophist. I'm not a biblical catastrophist, but, and I'm not getting my information with the book, but it turns out those people of the book were identifying something that, that was quite real, that there are dramatic global catastrophes that we can still see the remnants of and the evidence of today, and that shouldn't be ignored, all right? So it's kind of like by trashing religion, we, we, we threw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And it became very, very unpopular going back 200 years to speak of catastrophes because you were speaking from the past. You were speaking from the old religious dogmas and the received wisdoms. But that made modern science as it was developing dig in only on uniformitarianism, Right? And that everything had to be crammed in the uniformitarian box. And that anything you saw was the result of slow, regular processes, which we can identify today. We haven't seen a major geological impact in our lifetimes and are very unlikely to, probably much more likely than people um, accept, but we haven't seen one. So if we haven't seen one, they didn't happen. And if, but then things started to change. In the very, very late 70s and early 80s, um, the Alvarez team, father and son, very fortunate that Senior was um, a Nobel Prize winner, okay, or the father. So it made their radical proposition, although they had a rough, rough sledding for a while, it got attention more than ours did, I would say, that they hypothesized that the KT extinction, the Cretaceous tertiary, tertiary extinction where the dinosaurs were lost was a result of an impact. And that was heretical because that broke that uniformitarianism mindset. Here were established scientists that proposed that the dinosaurs didn't die out slowly of some unknown mysterious cause, that something actually slammed into the earth and and this is relevant to the younger Dryas event, very re relevant, um, and led to their demise. And let's see, how did they prove that ultimately? And it took 14 years. And there's some very interesting similarities between our hypothesis and theirs, which is now considered, you know, textbook fact. And that was that the Alvarezes came to their conclusion by virtue of testing fossilized sediments from that time period 65 million years ago, right? And when you go back to areas that continued to aggrade and build rock, because 65 million years is enough time to build rock from sediment, that you find a band of rock that's very special. And below that band, you find dinosaur fossils. Mm -hmm. And then above that band, you find none. And actually, the rock can sometimes change. Literally, things were just different after that moment. So they had the bright idea to test the KT boundary, as they call it. Very well accepted, studied, wonderful discovery, and a great idea. And they went and looked at that rock very, very closely, literally, you know, under microscopes and transmission electron microscopes 
and tested it chemically to see what its composition was and whether it had any unusual components. And indeed it did. They found micro, microspherules, for instance. We'll talk about those more. They found it elevated in iridium, right? And that was the key, key indicator because iridium is found worldwide, very low concentrations, but we have a, a, a certain target number. You say, well, on Earth, the crustal abundance of iridium that naturally is in the Earth's surface with no contribution whatsoever is known to be X. But then when we test this layer, you find vastly more iridium. So you're faced with the problem, was the Earth somehow producing more iridium at the time? Or was the iridium concentrating itself for some geological, uh, well-known, continually operating geological mechanism where it was just settling there for some reason? Um, and they also found, like I say, uh, actual physical remnants of the impact in there, which is um, a broad category of stuff, but, but um, microspherules. And they also found soot, very special soot called a cineform soot that can indicate very high temperature fires. So you've got a burn layer, if you will. Now it's encased in rock now, and that's important relative to younger Dryas. We'll get to a site with dinosaur bones below, none above. And then they uh, said, well, we believe something hit the earth, okay? And it left um, deposits of this material because there was a fallout winter around the planet where it was so dramatic and kicked so much material up into the atmosphere that the um, world burned from some of the fallback and the whole planet caught fire and that we also had a nuclear winter, if you will, is what we call it in terms of nuclear weapons, but where we were shaded out of the sun for years and that that led to an ecological collapse that very soon brought about the demise of the dinosaurs. But their problem was they didn't have a crater. They said something hit the earth, but they didn't have a crater that dated to 65 million years ago exactly. So they argued it out. And it was a, you know, there have been books written about the debate. And they were the outsiders and the heretics bringing back the idea of instantaneous global catastrophe. And that was to the displeasure of a lot of scientists, not because they were really anti-religious and they understood the Alvarez's were not speaking from the Bible or anything, but the idea within the discipline of geology and paleontology and a variety of other disciplines the, the, the overwhelming consensus was it's not legitimate at all. It's, it's kind of received wisdom again, just like you had received wisdom from the Bible that hung in there for a while and then got modified. Now we have received wisdom of uniformitarianism, right? That there could not be any global catastrophes, that that's stepping back in time and acting like you're a biblical literalist or anything or something like that. So people fought them, fought them, fought them hard until um, roughly uh, 2004, when it was published that um, there, uh, well, they had found a crater off the Yucatan Peninsula and a little bit congruent with the Yucatan Peninsula. And the Yucatan crater, and it was discovered by uh, oil science, you know, oil drilling and, and, and that type of stuff and, 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 and inspired scientists within the, the um, oil community said, we've got something interesting down here. And this looks to be an impact crater. And when that got out, then there was a, you know, the, the debate continued, but they had their crater and the debate continued and actually continues to this day to some extent. But that's when it started getting into the textbooks that we have a global layer that immediately, you know, is the termination of the dinosaurs. Then the world changed ecologically. The fauna completely changed. And that became accepted. So then let's fast forward to 2007. The paper that our group, which we uh, termed the Comet Research team, uh, Group, right? Mm -hmm. CRG, that we published a paper in 2007 that made a similar argument. That if we go back 12,800 years ago, what do we find? 
we find a black map of soil. And it's important to distinguish. Sometimes I'll see that they'll say that you call it the younger dryas black map. And that's a fun Google, I assure you. And 85, 90% of archeological sites in North America, where you can go dig down and find a Clovis point and a mammoth bone or a saber tooth tiger skull, not sure they actually find those at the Younger Dryas, but they certainly disappear then, or a, a, a bison antiquus, the old type of bison that went extinct. Where you start finding those remains are directly below a boundary, very distinct boundary. I can show it to you if you like. There's some iconic pictures in the Younger. So uh, just a quick question. Yeah. While when I'm doing that, you talk. When something enters the atmosphere, if it's a comet yeah. or something like that, is it possible that that wouldn't that 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 little? It's kind of like adding food to a fish tank, and then all the fish kind of react to it with uh, going up to the top. Is it possible that if something entered our atmosphere, that might have been uh, a giant sized comet or something? Could that throw off the environment or do something that could, without it even impacting it, just something that enters the atmosphere and just change it a little bit, kind of like um. If you do something to your backyard or if there's something like a small little change, if global warming can, you know, pol air pollution can change that, like, uh, what is it? Uh, light pollution. You can't mm -hmm. really see the stars as easy. So I look at that, like, could, if something entered our atmosphere, could that just be something a little bit different that could raise it one degree or throw it off a little bit of degrees that could cause this thing before it could impact? Or did it happen in such a fast amount of time where you, I believe we're so ignorant of things that things like that are possible, but we need to find evidence for them. Okay. And something like that wouldn't show a lot of evidence. And the evidence we find at the younger driest black mat suggests that something did impact, right? Because we find very similar evidence to that that they found to prove the dinosaurs were killed by a comet, right? Because when you test the younger driest black mat, you find the breath of hell. You find a variety a very special molten material that isn't going to melt to 3,000, 3,500 degrees centigrade, right? So, which is incomprehensibly hot temperatures. Okay. And so, you find just like they did at the dinosaur event, vaporized rock, right? Where when something impacts or even an air burst, you kick material up, particularly in an impact, that's putting it lightly. You kick material up and it's molten and it's molten down to the point of vapor. And that when that rock and some of the material, the impactor resolidifies, freezes, as you will, right? If you will, it falls back. And when you look at either the KT boundary um, or the younger driest black mat, you find a variety of spherules, right? little, little, little tiny balls. Some of them you can't see unless you use an electron microscope, right? Some of them are actually a good deal larger, particularly at the KT boundary. They found it around the world and probably will with the younger driest boundary when we do the proper research, but you can find them that you don't need a microscope. But that material is very hard to explain without a catastrophic circumstances. It's impossible to explain, right? So we found the younger driest black mat and re reported that it was already in the literature, but there was no explanation for it. And we did the same thing. We tested the material in that black mat. You find the spherules, you find the soot, and then you find our marker, which is not iridium in this case, although there are very strong suggestions that it's somewhat enriched in the iridium. But as things settled out and we were able to do enough testing, um, it turned out to be platinum. That the level of platinum in that band of dirt is orders of magnitude higher than you would expect in any part of the Earth's crust, right? So platinum is our marker. But let's talk about a little bit, you know, and you find the same phenomenon. For years, um, Archaeologists and paleontologists, when they were looking for um, the Pleistocene transition, and at that black mat and at that time, we actually separate, and this gets back to things being some parts of this are very well accepted, 
that the recent geological ages, the very most recent is called the Holocene. And that's kind of a time where humans began to flourish. And we can get to that too. Well, the Holocene begins 13,000 years ago. And before that's the Pleistocene. And that's, I believe, three and a half million years before that is its own age. And then you had successive ages that go back. Let me, let me. Um, this is blowing my up. mind because I thought the earth was only like 9,000 years old. Ah! <laughs> well, some people will say that somehow we're aiding those people, you know, or we're <laughs> under their influence because it, it you well, know. When you started, when you were, well, if we're talking about a yeah. comet impact or something that impacted this yep. earth, the first thing I start thinking of is I talked to, and when I talked to Avi Loeb, about, he was telling me the reason why he didn't think it was a comet, the Amoamoa, was because it, usually when you see a cometary tail or you see that tail, that's ice that's sprinkling off of it. So when I started thinking was if something came into our atmosphere, a comet, for instance, if you got close to the sun, you would start burning up before you even got even onto the sun. You would just start burning up. Right. So if something came into our atmosphere that was coming at such a high velocity that it created a bunch of fire around it, mm -hmm. the heat hits you first. So it wipes out everything that's on the planet. And then mm -hmm. afterwards, that, that icy tail that somehow didn't get the full blast of it entering the atmosphere just froze everything when it got done. So you didn't have, you, you had the impact and everything like that too, but you had a quick freeze like, so, you know, is that, possible? well, you might've had a freeze in our, uh, in uh, the way that we look at it, but it would have been because the earth's atmosphere at certain points was stripped away briefly, but it wouldn't have, you got to remember Robbie, this, the, the, those objects are moving incredibly fast, right? Like 60, 70,000 miles an hour, some of them. Okay. So that's, um, you know, a hundred times the speed of a rifle bullet. I couldn't even imagine it. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes in so quick. You don't have a whole lot of time except for what's going to happen happens instantly. And then things settle out in a variety of different ways. Some people uh, misinterpreted our hypothesis and thought that we were saying, because we don't believe it was a single point. And that's a very important point that I'll get to in a second that has to do with impact frequency estimates for how dangerous this stuff is going forward. Okay, but we said <clears throat> that it was a fragmenting comet. And one of our chief critics has gone to great lengths to explain that you couldn't have the comet hit the outside of the atmosphere and have enough, and he's right, have enough time for it to disintegrate on the way down. There might be some disintegration, but it's not going to go into a swarm yeah. when it hits the ground right? Because it's just, it's almost instantaneous. Okay, but that's not what we were saying. And this is very important. That a group of astronomers, uh, particularly in um, the British Isles, that are referred to and can be looked up on the internet, um, are referred to as the British neo-catastrophists. Okay, and these were established astronomers, uh, particularly astronomers, uh, in the UK and elsewhere over there, that have been claiming since the 70s, we've been looking at it wrong, right? That the impact threat is, first of all, not from asteroids, that there's going to be giant rocks that somehow become, you know, uh, 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 disassociated from the asteroid belt and you get hit by a single block of iron that we call an asteroid. But increasingly, we've seen that the comets to asteroids is a, a, a band of, you know, there's a lot of gray area that, Comets might have used to be in asteroids, and asteroids could become comets. Mostly comets become asteroids after they completely burn out, and you just leave the husks of solid material. But that our hypothesis was that when we see comets come into the solar system, okay, uh, they disintegrate, okay, and they call it hierarchical disintegration, that this is, has nothing to do with the atmosphere, but they begin to break apart, not all of them, okay? Perhaps all of them at some point, but well, some the of them begin the, the process immediately. Okay. And that the leftovers from those disintegrations, this is pretty well accepted, is what we call um, shooting stars and meteor showers, particularly the shower part, that the meteor showers we encounter can all be traced back to a parent body that hierarchically disintegrated, goes into two pieces, two each go into two, then you got four, all four go into two, if you look at it in that simple way, and all of a sudden you've got millions and millions of pieces. Now it doesn't do it totally uniformly, you could end up with one big piece left, 
which there certainly is for the meteor stream associated with what we believe calls the Younger Dryas crash and the extinctions, we believe goes back to the Torrid meteor stream and Comet Inky, which there is still a three and a half year period comet out there, but it's associated with a meteor stream that we pass through twice a year in late June, early July, and in late October, early November, right? Because of orbital, uh, orbital dynamics, we encounter it twice and we see a beautiful little meteor shower over a period of a week. We believe, and here's one of the flaws in the way they look at it, when they're looking forward and saying, okay, what are the chances of an impact? Okay, they do that math and do that analysis based on the idea of us being hit by one point, be it an asteroid, and then they totally dismiss because there are many fewer comets around than there are asteroids or one comet hitting the earth. But they don't do the math if it is disintegrating or in some mode, you know, uh, some epoch of its disintegration, right? So think of it this way. Do you have to be a better shot if you're using a rifle or a shotgun? Better shot a rifle. rifle. Yeah. Yeah. Shotgun gives you a big, wide area of pain <laughs> where if you're anywhere in it, you're going to get hit. That's what we believe happened in the Younger Dryas, that they would say, well, it's statistically impossible. It'd be so unlikely for that point of a comet to hit the earth. It might happen, you know, every um, 5 million years, 30 million years. So it's happened once since the dinosaurs, at least on a large, large scale with the Chesapeake Bay and crater. Chesapeake Bay is, is an old crater and that was about 35 million years ago. So they say, well, that, that periodicity of over tens of millions of years, you might encounter that point in space given the number of comets that we have. What they don't account for is what happens if that comet is in the earlier stages of disintegration where it's not little meteor shower bits. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's some of those in there. But there are plenty of large chunks still around. And those chunks have a much wider profile in space. And if you hit any part of it over several million miles, so essentially you've got something that could be a million miles wide that we encounter. Now it's not a single point, but it's shotgun BBs of varying sizes. So we believe, and again, back to how they misinterpret this, they thought when we said fragments of a comet, the comet hit the top of the atmosphere, it fragmented and somehow hit all over the earth. And yeah, there are problems with that. I wouldn't have said it if that would have been contrary to, um, to what would be physically possible. What we say is that we encountered a very, very bad day of the torrid meteor stream and that that comet likely entered the solar system about excuse me, 20,000 years ago and was in the process of disintegrating. And it actually becomes less and less dangerous, right? Because it's splitting up into smaller and smaller pieces. And, but as good friend uh, Bill Napier, who's a neo-catastrophist in England, a prominent astronomer, if a bit heretical, <laughs> right? A little bit sidelined because of these ideas he's been publishing for 40 years. He says it's like we're putting on a blindfold and walking across a highway, right? If you think about it, if it's a random time of day, right? And you walk across a highway with a blindfold on, you might walk across that highway many times and not get hit. Might be some close calls, but if it's three o'clock in the morning, you're probably going to make it across. Yeah. But if you happen to walk across it when it's um, just pre-rush hour, there are a whole lot of cars and they're still going fast and there's some trucks in there, Yeah, you get hit sometimes, right? And that's how when we pass through the torrid stream today, the cars are getting smaller, right? They would have been larger 13,000 years ago. There'd have been giant trucks and there's still a few trucks out there. But that we went through a period where we were encountering a certain part of the torrid meteor stream that caused us certainly one trauma 12,800 years ago. But now we believe it may even be, and we don't have the science for this, this is more speculation, that there might have been a, a period where every few years you got that. 
every three and a half years because that's the the period of the um, toward meteor stream. We encounter it every you know six months, but I believe there's some uh, relationship to you know also the three and a half years. Okay, so that we're walking across that road. 13,000 years ago, we walked across the road and had a very, very bad day. And it left the black mat all across the United States and Europe and other places we've identified. And that that was a marker that we call the Younger Dryas boundary. Now, interestingly enough, let me show you the black mat real quick. And you're disabled from screen sharing right now? Um, you, yeah, you sh it should just be you. Really? Hold on. When I tried it a second ago, it... try it again. Okay, let me. Oh. Should be at the bottom. It should share screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm mostly on Teams these days. I have to do my. Okay. Okay, so there's the younger, driest black mat. See that? See how things change? That's thousands and thousands of years of very slow processes, just as is the common paradigm. But then there was a really bad day right there. All right. And that left that black matte band. Here's a good example of it. That's kind of the iconic picture. Now, have can you, you see that? I've got a super widescreen monitor. I'm not sure sometimes what's visible. Yeah, I, I can see it. I'm just wondering. So you've seen this in person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, is it when you look at it, when you're physically in front of it, because a lot of people aren't going to have access to be able to see something like this besides looking at pictures. When you're physically in front of it, looking at this, is it very clear to tell that there's two different distinctions or two different characteristics of basically the same exact thing that you're looking at? Like, oh, yes. Obvious? Okay. Absolutely. And, and, and here's the interesting thing. It wasn't like we discovered the black mat. It was always known to paleontologists, archaeologists, soil scientists. And let's just say you're a um, paleontologist and you're looking for mammoth bones or you're an archaeologist and you're looking for the last or you're looking for the first Clovis points as you dig down. Right. They used to know that when you got to the black mat, that's when you would find the stuff. Right. But they did not take it the next step and said, well, what the hell's in the young? What's in that? No one went and actually tested it like the Alvarez's did. But that was the hack that allowed us to support our hypothesis or the first evidence that led to the hypothesis, the first data. And the idea was that all across the U.S., I believe I just saw one. Okay, see that map there? Mm -hmm. um, that's actually one of the most, the most senior paleo archaeologist in the country, C. Vance Haynes, wrote a very good paper that helped bring some support, if tepid support, because it was so new in 2007. He wrote a paper that said, hey, I've been studying um, Clovis sites, if you will. He was looking for the, the Clovis culture, their brief period, which was now very well disputed and, and mostly thrown out that there weren't any previous inhabitants North America, but certainly the most dramatic one as you go back in the first dramatic culture you see um, or occupation by Indians, uh, paleo Indians you see, um, is the Clovis people. So he'd been studying this his entire career. We came out with a hypothesis and he said, yep, never really done the work. But if you go look at all the sites we've identified as, you know, um, um, Clovis sites, which have good stratigraphy, right? Not just a surface find, but we actually know we dig down and we find them here. <clears throat> How many of them are associated with black mats? And you can see it was the vast majority, right? That there was that same black band. Here's one. It looks different at every location, right? In some locations, it's just not there. That the, the physics, you know, neither the geophysics wasn't there for whatever particular reason to, to make it very dramatic. And that's true in the Southeast. That's in Europe, right? That's in Lommel, Belgium. Um, 
it's just it, to me i just i mean i don't put it above people i really don't i don't put it above our government on anything but just to even if you have a somewhat of a sliver of an idea of a, maybe a hypothesis not saying to where it's at now but even at the start of it do you not want that outside thinking like why would you dismiss it as such like i get it if you're thinking about like textbooks like we already put it in the textbooks it's this so let's just walk away it's kind of like um when you go to a site that's been like a burn or something like that they're like it was this yep. match and i'm like how do you know it was just that match it's like because i don't feel like digging anymore it's like okay but yep. it, it just seems lazy in a sense where now we have all these years and all these kids that are, are reading old outdated textbooks in a sense that are thinking like for me i thought it was just one asteroid like a bullet that just hit but if you look at it from like kind of what you're describing a little bit too if it just broke off and we didn't think about maybe if it was already in space heading into our atmosphere and it started to break off and then you had multiple chunks that landed everywhere that well, would explain hold on. you have multiple chunks out there in space okay at all times and then we happened to cross into them and then we would have had two or three days of everything from shooting stars to possibly impacts that could have created the newly discovered hiawatha crater which is 22 miles wide in in greenland which um today can't be accurately dated but they believe was up that the last time it could have been formed was thirteen thousand years ago but back to your question just think about it that you 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 have a few days where instead of shooting stars you're getting everything trucks cars motorcycles toy cars <laughs> that you're hitting everything on the highway some big some small and that you have air bursts, right? Say the vast majority, you're going to have more of the small stuff, right? Maybe you have two or three big chunks. And those leave craters at various locations that either have uh, not been, have been discovered, but, but not directly dated to this, or they are undiscovered as yet. And there's a great candidate I mentioned again in Greenland. Or everything up to, you know, say 50 meters, depending on its composition, um, may just blow up in the atmosphere and you'd have hundreds and hundreds perhaps thousands of nuclear scale explosions with all the effects of a nuclear bomb minus the radiation so if right? I, if that's an extinction event but there was a survival of just the megafauna so when we're talking about life coming back is that a whole restart so it's like the way that they think of it is like people like don't believe that there were humans and dinosaurs together as well too so i look mm -hmm. at it like if it was a thing that was an extinction we always hear about the dinosaurs it was a comet that wiped the dinosaurs out but if a, a megafauna was able to survive or some type of plant life or something we wouldn't even think to categorize first if you're looking at like a t-rex seems the most sexy to a lot of people um mm -hmm. and life had to restart from that that this will be a better explanation that you would have all this a, a complete not really a complete extinction but a 99.9% .9 extinction event in a sense because you're having multiple areas get hit it's like if you have one impact then someone who might be on the other side of the globe might survive yeah. but if you have multiple then everything's getting hit at once no matter how big or how far down on the earth you really go if you're trying to hide underground or something well this was a selective extinction right and it wouldn't have been nearly as severe or we wouldn't be here as the KT impact into the Yucatan, right? If that had happened 13,000 years ago, be a good question. You know, would we expect any humans at all to survive? But, but probably not, right? This, though it was very, very dramatic, it had a climate effect and probably a variety of different toxic effects, if you will. There's some question about what the chemistry would have been at the time but it selectively took out the megafauna, right? You don't see small mammals disappearing, right? Two species of birds actually go extinct, which is interesting because that asks you, how did the Clovis people hunt the last bird of a particular type? I mean, they had to be very, very busy. <laughs> to not, it's 250 species of animal go extinct within that period or shortly thereafter. So, You've got to say that the Clovis people hunted every one of those down to the very last one. But we didn't knock out 99% of all species. There was probably less than 1% of all species. But they happen to be the ones that are, um, as you call them, they're called charismatic megafauna, right? That they're interesting beasts. Mm -hmm. They're big, large, savannah-type beasts that all blink out. Now, who would have been most sensitive 
two, um, dramatic climate change and loss of habitat. The bigger they it are, would have the been the big stuff. Fall. Yeah. Yeah, the big stuff starved, wasted away. Probably a lot of them died that very day, but not all of them. And a lot of people mischaracterize that about our stuff too. We'll say, well, ah, the, this or that was found afterwards. Like the woolly mammoth that survived um, up to 4,000 years ago. So the Egyptians and the woolly mammoth were contemporaneous for a little while, but they were on Wrangell Island in the farthest reaches of you know Siberia, right? So we're not saying every all of those animals disappeared that day, but that it led to their demise. And there actually could have been involvement with the, the surviving Clovis people having hunted some of the last ones down has been proposed. <clears throat> but, but what we're saying is that, that that bad few days, one way or another, led to their demise in a relatively short period. And let's put it in context. So sometimes I like to just, for people that, are new to these ancient timelines. Sometimes you'll say 13,000 years ago and 65 million, and they'll kind of think, well, those are both a long time ago. Mm. You got to remember how much longer 65 million is than 13,000. It's 3,500 times as long ago. So if you took a timeline and stretched it from where I am in Raleigh, North Carolina to San Diego, right? The dinosaur extinction would have been in San Diego. and this would have been down at the uh, 7-Eleven about a mile away, right? And that's one of the problems for the mainstream to get back to why do they reject that? We need to, I need to answer you a little, little bit better on that. That was unthinkable to the mainstream. They had come to accept that there were cosmic impacts that had global consequences on flora and fauna, and that being the iconic one that knocked off the dinosaurs. And that took us 40 years now to have that fully accepted. And then we accepted, uh, lesser known, but uh, the Chesapeake Bay impact 35 million years ago. And that probably had some species consequences, although I'm not as familiar with it. And, but the idea that just 13, one 3,500th of the time ago, the dinosaurs that we encountered another extinction level event, an ELE as you call it, is just too recent for them that it changes, let's get to why they rejected it. You talk about something that rewrites the textbooks. Everything has to be reconsidered. When, when you accept this theory, you are rejecting vast, vast amounts of literature across dozens of different disciplines. Anything that studies or believes it knows what happened in the human past, let's say back 40,000 years, right? While they were art making humans. And that's important because we believe they remembered it. That that's just unthinkable to them. And you're not enough of a cynic yet, Robbie, which is a good thing. Right? And you don't want to become too cynical. But when I got into this, I'd come out of politics a few years, well, right about the same time in 1995, 96, I'd worked in the US Senate for six years. I was a pretty cynical young man. You know, I mean, you go and watch all the horrible backbiting and pettiness and, and, and immaturity and viciousness in major league politics. You come out of that thinking that, well, I know how bad it can get and how unfair the world is, right? And then you got into this and it didn't hold a candle to it. That academics are worse than anyone on sticking to their established paradigm. And that's the word. The paradigm is that things happen uniformly and then nothing much happened in the past that we couldn't see today or interpolate from the landscape or various processes somewhere on the earth today. And then someone comes along and suggests, no, mm -mm, actually just 13,000 years, which is only three or four times the, the time of the first um, of the pyramid building Egyptians, right? There were people around back then. This was witnessed. That was unthinkable because all of that had been relegated after it was accepted that there were catastrophes. They had to kind of put it way back there and say this doesn't happen 
anymore. One of our chief antagonists, a guy named Mark Bosla, he says it's just too unlikely. Now, this has its own set of logical problems, but why would we, at our point in time, be able to look and see something so recent that should be so rare? Well, first of all, we contend it's not as rare as you think, right? But then I would also contend it's because it created us. You know, the naked ape with the black mirror is a direct result of the Younger Dryas impact. We were forced to go from plucking pears to pulling plows. It changed our relationship and our organizational ability and our uh, functioning mechanisms that after that impact, for whatever reasons, and we could speculate, that's when agriculture began. That's when Gobekli Tepe, the temple in Turkey, that's the oldest known human-made yeah. megalithic structure. It's built right when we pop out of the Younger Dryas. And there's some very good evidence, again, very controversial, that Gobekli Tepe was actually a memorial of those people saying, hey, here's when this happened. It happened well before our time, but something really, really, really bad happened. And you need to know that it was 12,800 years ago. Kind of like people's um, or everyone's idea that the world was going to end in 2012 because of the mind calendar of when it stopped. Sure. But in reverse, it's like saying something that something did happen and you need to be aware of that. And we're going to encode it in stone and we're going to use various pictographic figures of animals that relate to the constellations to put a time stamp. Go Beckley Tepe in my buddy Martin Sweatman's analysis was a time stamp for the Younger Dryas impacts, right? So again, the likelihood of this happening, it's not an independent event that we're sitting here discovering something that should happen so rarely so recently no because it happened is why is why we're sitting here talking because we had to civilize now it might have been some people might have said that the previous way was a better way but we had to learn to grow our own food and not be hunter gatherers anymore right and that's the way we reacted to it those survivors did in their many generations afterwards, you know, for a couple thousand years, that as things settled down, we changed our life ways. And those life ways led to gathering in cities, writing, agriculture, et cetera. And now it didn't really take off till the, you know, early Bronze Age. But that was only half this time ago, right? You had to have some setup time, started changing our ways. And Abu Herrera and some other early villages go back even further, eight or 9,000 years. Well, Abu, excuse me, goes back to, they, they are um, uh, not agriculturalists at the time, but we find settlements and actually did a astounding paper on one called Abu Herrera in Syria, where we have evidence that, you know, of the, what happened to the people there. You have bone with melted glass on it, right? You have the imprint of plants, including some that were probably domesticated um, early, early wheat and whatnot. It's actually imprinted on melted glass that had to be, you know, heated to three or 4,000 C to melt the material and then result in what they call phytoliths, the imprints of various things within it. But Abu Herrera um, was completely wiped out and it's interesting the the that's a radical thing that's one of the most famous archaeological sites uh in the middle east but it was because they had to go do uh crisis archaeology they were going to fill a dam in in um syria and we're going to flood what was known to be a potential slow work archaeological site we should look at this for 20 years well they had to run in there and excavate it all you know, before they filled the dam up. So they got a lot of information on Abu Herrera pretty quickly. And um, that was uh, led by several people, including a, 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 a fellow named Andrew Moore. And Andrew Moore built his career off of Abu Herrera and eventually became 
the president of the American Institute of Archaeology, the number one archaeologist in the country. And people call us, you know, our group fringe people. Well, he was the lead author of the Abu Herrera paper. In his entire time digging that site and seeing how it disappeared very suddenly, it had never occurred to him, nor should it have necessarily occurred to him, that it might have been a cosmic impact that led to their demise. When the data was presented to Dr. Moore, 35 years, I believe, after he had originally dug it, and years after they published papers for years after based on the data, when he was presented with the, the data and he shared some of the material from Abu Herrera, and we find the elevated platinum, the microspherules, the soot, all of those kinds of things are found at Abu Herrera. And he said, well, now I know. Now I know what caused the demise of my you know, Paleolithic village. I, I'm throwing in with y'all. And he led the paper. And that's the number one archaeologist in the world. But you still, it gets back to your thing. They resist it completely. Because everybody that studies that period First of all, they'd be compelled to immediately start collecting samples, sending it to the labs within their own institutions that have the qualifications and technical equipment to actually look at it properly, because they don't now. You know, um, somebody told me, and this applies to archaeologists too and whatnot, but the geologists look down and the astronomers look up and they don't talk to each other. So when you tell somebody that's used to looking down all the time and digging and all of that kind of stuff, they ain't thinking about, am I come encountering anything that came from above? But they emphatically are, and they relegate the results of, of, of that to um, that. Um, well, let me just move on. Um, the, 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 they have to, oh, to mystery. That they say, well, it's just a mystery what happened to Abu Herrera. It's a mystery what happened to the Clovis people. It's like when right? I hear the word coincidence. So they're comfortable, yeah, they're comfortable with the word mystery, but not uncomfortable with a very adequate explanation that we've provided. It's like whenever I hear the word coincidence, I'm like, I, I just, that just seems like not a good answer a lot of times. Right. It's like you want a, a clear one. I'm looking at this like, are you starting to see more of an attraction to the hypothesis now? Because I mean, I, I, I'm a listening person. I'm going to listen. My audience is going to listen, but I'm not a Joe Rogan. I'm not I, like you're having podcasters or people come across as like Joe Rogan helps get the word out there. That's a great yeah. impact. That, that's that's awesome for you guys. But you need more of an academic look through it as well, too. Are you starting to see that now? Are you given a platform? Are you given a, a thing of discussion at a university to be able to have a TED talk or something? Because the people that I'm able to reach out to are the ones that are getting listed in Wikipedia under scientific theories. But then when we go to uh, pseudoscience, this is labeled in pseudoscience. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. Who's labeling this and let me yeah. talk to someone involved in this because I'm the type of person when someone says something or the general public says something about somebody, I need to talk to that person because I don't like how people can easily label somebody as something. I've talked to plenty of people that have been labeled horrible things and it's not that at all. But pseudoscience, I'm like, isn't the whole point of science that every day is learning to go towards a new discovery or something changes or something is different than it was before? But it seems like they'd had this one narrative and now people are either too stubborn to change, which is interesting because if we look at global warming, you would think people would be less or more apt to give up the blaming of turning the world to crap on something else. They would want to push right. it off onto something else. But everyone is so like in victim mentality mode where everything is their fault that they're all willing to accept. Yep, it's our fault. But how do we change it? And they're fighting each other. They're not coming up with logical yep. answers to do so, which is like the progress bar has been halted. And if anything, it's going in reverse where I'm looking at how are we ever going to advance as a human species if we can't stop tripping over our own foot? Robbie, that is an excellent analysis. And we think the same way that what's happened with science, and maybe it's because of the politics of it, and it's turned into a big ass science, you know, <laughs> instead of a process of debate and discovery and hypothesis and refutation, that there's some things that we've decided this is what it is. Sometimes I think that every scientist should in their field have one crazy idea, right? Because the history of science is that at any given moment, there's going to be a whole lot of crazy ideas that just aren't right, but they're always some that were right or we would not have advanced. Every advance in science was considered 
heretical at the time it was proposed to the discipline to which it was proposed, right? That's what you're thinking. There used to be a progress, and that progress is well-defined by a fellow named, philosopher named Thomas Kuhn in the 60s called the um, uh, uh, Revolution of Scientific Paradigms. And he wrote a book that said that <clears throat> you have a paradigm, everybody's agreed to it, somebody's going to come out, they're going to challenge the paradigm. Well, first of all, it'll get in crisis. It'll have a bunch of mysteries, <laughs> right? And people will be comfortable with those mysteries we still don't know, but then someone will try to explain it and they will be sidelined, rejected, and pushed back because they were comfortable with the paradigm, even with the mysteries, right? And the complications and the various hoops they had to go through and the Rube Goldberg machines of intellect that they had to come up with to try to resolve what they're seeing and continue to keep the new explanation sidelined. But then you have a, um, a revolution of thinking where it becomes in such crisis and the explanation fits so well that people start to get on board. And that's what we've been seeing with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. One of the key parts of it is who has come along independently, who was not on the original paper or subsequent papers. There's a whole other unfortunate dynamic there. But <clears throat> where when someone joins one of our papers, then they're part of our team. And our team is pseudoscientists. So they go from being a real scientist to a pseudoscientist as soon as they accept the data or discover some of the data themselves. But then there's an interesting phenomenon where it's a big world out there. And there may be people who are relatively stuck in their paradigm, but they're just curious to use their own tools and literally their own locations that may have special attributes that are worthy of studying in this context. And they'll go out and test the soil. Simple as that. And see what they find with no coordination with us. And every time that happens, they come up in support. Right. And then they're part of the comet research group God, <laughs> and they're sidelined. <laughs> that's that's such leeching success. It's crazy. Like that's like if you, something's good, like someone can talk as much trash on you as possible. And then as soon as you start doing well or you start sewing, they come out of the woodwork out of nowhere. Like, hey, I was a part. I knew that I knew him in high school. It's like, no, you didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's a lot of that stuff goes on. That's oh, right. Oh, my God. For instance, one of the great paleontologists of South Africa had a site that they knew. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Alexa. Somehow. Yeah. You said, sorry, I knew. I think Alexa thought you said its name. <laughs> yeah. Creepy as always, right? <laughs> oh, but a fellow in South Africa at the university there, this the, you know, pinnacle of, of pa paleontology. They know their soil and they know their time. And usually they're working 100,000 years back on hominins and whatnot, but they know the ages of their soil. And he took it upon himself, his name escapes me right now, but he took it upon himself, say, hey, I'm going to look for some of that platinum. I'm going to go take a little centimeter cube of soil here and here and here and here and here and go down the face that we have well established the age of. And again, that's an important part and part of the hack of how we got into this because they already knew the ages. That was undisputed. And then he tested the soil down it and boom. He gets an order of magnitude, I think it was a thousand times. I don't want to speak out, but he hadn't looked at it in a while. This was just three, four years ago. And then he wrote a paper. He said, I, he didn't say this, but it was clear he had never been in touch with us. He didn't let us know about any of the data. He was just a real scientist, right? He said, I'm curious. And I want to see, does my well-established and well-dated site conform with this hypothesis? Does it show elevated platinum? And he wrote a paper that said, holy shit, it sure did. And then a fellow at Harvard in 2013, um, well, I want to say Petrov, but he's the fellow on a um, similar name, but a Russian name. He's a you know Harvard scientist of some note. He went back and looked at the ice core. Not everybody has access to that stuff. So you got to be, you know, and you looked at the ice cores from Greenland, of which they're, you know, a handful that are all used by scientists all over the world, if you can get access to it, or at least their data is used after they do the primary research on it. But he went back and he found a dramatic spike in platinum 13,000 years ago. And he was, I guess, somewhat forced to reach the conclusion, wish he'd followed up on it more. But then he wrote a paper that said, yes, 13,000 years ago, there is an unusual and inexplicable abundance of platinum in the Greenland ice core at just this time. And then that actually brought around, and this is all on the cosmic tusk, 
I followed it through the years. Remember the guy I mentioned a long time ago built his, uh, or mentioned earlier in the episode, a uh, fellow named Wallace Broker. And he was kind of a, they actually call him the father of global warming, that he was one of the first people to, you know, be concerned about global warming because he studied the Younger Dryas and said that the climate could snap suddenly. And that was been the basis of his career. And when we presented the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis uh, for the, I guess, about the third time at the American Geophysical Union, the big geoscience conference with thousands of people out each year, we presented it in 2010, and he was absolutely against it. And that was tough. So you got the younger, number one younger Dryas scientist in the world saying that no way did a cosmic impact cause my iconic period that I've spent my, you know, 50 years in research studying Wally Broker. I actually talked to him out there. We we're out in San Francisco. I met Wally, tried to talk him up on it, but he made a presentation and said, no way. Well, he died about two or three years ago. And not long before he died, he sent out a memo to his colleagues uh, at Columbia University at their geophysics lab and said, I think it caused the Younger Dryas. So the number one guy accepted right before his death, based off of the publications, and particularly the one that I just mentioned, where the fellow from Harvard, Pietev, that's what it is, discovered the abundance of platinum, he had actually initiated that <clears throat> to some degree. He had told him, go look at this. I've been trashing it, but go take a look. I looked at it. Then he watched the subsequent research we did after 2013. And by the time he died in 2017, 2018, 19, whatever it was, he was on board, right? So you bring the people along. And it's funny, the brain, ones you bring along are, are the best ones. They're some of the biggest voices. They're not just the go along with the crowd. I've got a PhD. I get millions in funding. I'm an established scientist, but I ain't a risk taker. Well, to damn grow your field, you need to be a risk taker. And what we've done is we've atomized scientists. So they're just looking at the very, very small things in their field and trying to advance the field tiny bit by tiny bit within the existing paradigm. But the big thinkers like Wally Broker, who brought the younger drives to our attention, he was a big enough thinker that he took it all in and said, these guys are right. And that's all documented. If you, you know, search Wally on the Cosmic Tusk, you can read about that and read that memo. And what we do at the Cosmic Tusk is try to, preserve, you know, everything that I discuss, if there's a paper mentioned or a memo mentioned or anything like that, we put it all there, right? And if I can, I'd like to jump to, so we've been talking a while and I'm happy to talk as long as you want to, but I do not want to miss, here's the website. I'll take a share here. I mean, okay. it's, great, it's great for you guys that you guys got that memo where he mentioned it, but at the same time, oh, it, is. It, it just sucks that the only way you can really get motivation or get anything moving is if you have a named figure or someone in the public eye to be able to kind of promote it out there as well, too. I just wish people would be more open to ideas coming from someone who doesn't even, who might not have a resume. Like, I feel like you got to give everybody an opportunity and hear them out at some point. Well, I've got a theory on that. Rob, you're a very intuitive young man. You're going to be great on this subject as, th as things develop, man. Because you're right. It does suck that you got to get a big dog to come along, but at least there's some of them that are willing to do it, right? And, and that's what Broker did. The unfortunate thing is no one has followed up in any of the mainstream science publications, like say Science or Nature, and just do a little piece, you know, not a formal paper, but a news piece or a retrospective piece on Wally that says, holy cow, he agreed with them before he died. It's never been reported outside the cosmic tusk. You got to check who's fun in the bottom of those National Geographic websites. If you see a Biden or Trump ad, you know what political party, at least they're standing. That's with. right. It, well, that's, uh, you know, that gets to. Um, so here's the here's the cosmic tusk. And I try to po post um, every week. Uh, that's a little funny thing, you know, mi remix somebody did. Some of them are, you know, more lighthearted. That's I got I got a name drop on Rogan. Here's the discovery of a comet airburst using that exact same science um, just 1,700, 1,800 years ago in North America. Because we believe this happens, has happened many times in varying degrees of magnitude. 
and probably four times since the Younger Dryas impact, that worldwide, you'll see, for instance, tree rings constrain and not grow. And the debate is, <clears throat> such that it is, uh, most of that's attributed to volcanoes, that there was a dramatic volcano and it caused every world, every tree in the, you know, studied to constrict its rings and grow slowly for a few years, right? And some of us believe that those are attributable to subsequent air bursts and that other cultural declines other than the Clovis in the Bronze Age even um, could have been the result. They'll say it was a drought. The tremendous drought wiped out all these cultures and caused instability and they all fell apart in the Middle Bronze Age and whatnot. Um, but we believe that there's, you know, fair speculation that, that that was air bursts as well, that we encountered the torrid meteor stream, probably didn't have a major globe rocking impact, but we would have had a series of, you know, nuclear explosions without the radiation, tremendously ener energetic events. And here, uh, Ken Tankersley at the University of Cincinnati went back and looked at the Hopewell culture, right, which um, flourished for, you know, three, 400 years and then kind of blinked out or declined and went into a different way and never quite got their mojo back. And he went back and looked at the Indian mounds. I was going to look at something else, but this is interesting. And he published this paper about a month ago. There's one of the Indian mounds that seems to show a comet. Right, so that might have been subsequent builders, or maybe they were encountering that comet for a few years before they built it. But he goes to the habitation surface back when, you know, things were flourishing, and he finds all the same evidence: the spherules, elevated certain concentrations, um, chemical changes, etc. And this is early research. But he found all the same. And that actually got a pretty good response in the press. And, you know, frankly, the Younger Dryas impact event has had a fair response in the press. I mean, there's tremendous. You now, they're mostly skeptical articles that end with mainstream, doesn't think it's true. But it's such an exciting thing and so interesting that people, it does get reported on. It's just hard to find a respectable article when you're talking about something like this that's not going to give it like a really flashy headline, like hypothesis. As soon as they toss, I get it's theory and it's a hypothesis or whatever. It just, it for the public, like myself or something, it sounds like, oh, this is going to be like some type of like entertainment thing or it's going to be some type of like some yeah. person's opinion and it's like even when i see like a washington post or something like that as soon as i see opinion on it like that that discredits whether the information is true or not it's not really discrediting it it just makes people go like well this is going to be an interesting read it's like we'll go into it thinking that this is actually going to be something that might change it might be a new narrative that's going to end up being pushed out there but you don't want to be the last person to hop on and it's very hard being the first person involved in it as well too because that's Nobody's, right, Robbie. Nobody's... This stuff comes out as clickbait, but people don't understand how profoundly important it is, right? That it actually may be why we're here in the form that we are. Sometimes I call the Younger Dress Impact, um, I frequently refer to it as, as the Rosetta Stone of Earth and Human History. You know, the Rosetta Stone? Yeah. After we finally decoded it, we were able to read all the, you know, read the hieroglyphs, right? And this allows us to read geology and species development and a variety of other things in a different light after you are willing to take it seriously. If not accept it, it helps explain things that previously were purely mysterious. So if you go to the Cosmic Tusk, one of my favorite features of it, worked very hard on it with a friend, uh, Mark Young from Australia, someone who I've never met in person. But I'm oh, sorry, man. You're good, Ben. All right, we're, get, we're coming close to the two hour mark, but I want to make sure you uh, can promote your site as well, too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy you gave me a little bit of your time as well, too, man. I'd love to have you back on to go. You got to let me listen back to this episode, too, because all the information, I'm surprised you have it. So, I mean, I get it because, like I told you before, your site is thoroughly well done. You have so much information as well here. This is what I came across where you can click these things and it gives That's you. That's right. Detail. I That's wanted to leave your, your listeners with this. If you go to the Cosmic Tusk from the front page and drop down this little menu and go into here, 
This is not reporting on the event. This is the literature behind it. Every single paper published since we first introduced the evidence in 2007 in Firestone et al. And I was on that original paper with um, 17 others. Or was it 23 at the time? But that kicked off a debate. And the supportive papers, if you will, and there's a little bit of editorial discretion here because they don't, people don't list their paper supporting or non-supporting of the hypothesis, but are in green. And then the skepticals are out and out opposed are in red. So you can see that there's just a really overused term, but robust debate, right? So it caught science's attention. There's no question about it that there's not enough, they're not studying it themselves, but they do publish against us and try to poke holes in it. And Martin Sweatman and more lately, uh, Mr. Jim Powell, Dr. Powell, who was originally a skeptic of this, was an eminent geologist, had been president of three universities, head of a major museum, a couple of them. This is a big dude. He was totally skeptical of it, finally looked into it, you know, on his own time, read all the papers, talked to one of our lead authors, who was an old colleague of him, who he thought had gone crazy, Jim Kennett, also a, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, so it doesn't get any bigger. He's on our team and has been since the original paper, went and talked to Jim, took it seriously, and now he has gone back and detailed this debate and wrote a paper right there. Just when was it? earlier, you know, last month. And it was a beautiful paper, premature, pre premature rejection in science, the case of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. And this is a review paper where you're actually getting into, you know, not new data or uh, the very particular parts of it, but rather, how did this proceed? How, if I go back as Jim Powell and read all these papers and follow the whole debate, how fairly has this been treated? Has it met the higher standards of science for open dialogue and debate, right? And he concluded it had not, that we had been unfairly trashed from the beginning, that science is embarrassing itself by not treating our hypothesis fairly, and that it's an intellectual crime the way we've been treated. Now, I don't like to play victim, you know, because I think we're going to win this thing. But we have been treated unfairly. And another fellow, Martin Sweatman, detailed the same process in a series of videos. He went and read every single paper, and all that's on YouTube, and detailed what he, how he thought the debate proceeded. And it turns out most of the critics' papers that try to undermine the hypothesis were either threadbare where they were almost ad hominem attacks. And there are a number of those. One time they called it, they, they, they said a requiem for the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis in the paper's <clears throat> actual headline. I'm going to turn my phone off. Imagine if you're getting a call from someone like, we got to do a Netflix doc on you. <laughs> like, and you're sitting here. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey. <laughs> Funny. Uh, yeah, it needs more of that. Um, so... <clears throat> There have been two recent cases of, of very, very, you know, of, of great scientific minds going back, uh, Powell and Sweatman. And let's look at this as a sociological way, kind of the way you were thinking about it. Why in the hell aren't, you know, why don't I hear more about this? Why do people reject it, et cetera, and so forth? And they document that in great detail. And I would imagine when our critics read it, you're probably even causing some degree of embarrassment or regret. I was saying a moment ago that the, one of the papers they published was called a requiem for the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. And a requiem is something you do after something's dead. Well, they called the requiem in 2011, you know, three years after we'd rolled the thing out. Well, you don't know three years after something. No one had totally disproven it. They tried to kill it and put it to bed and drive a stake in its heart because it was such a threat to their existing work, right? And I get that. You know, if you've been teaching on something for 30 years and it turns out that a lot of what you said was completely uninformed, unwittingly, but you're still teaching it, 
and it remains uninformed, you know, that ain't right. But there's a threat to these people from this, and they do not accept it lightly. But fortunately, the evidence is global. That anybody that looks at it with the proper forensic tools can discover it. And that over time, you get independent support from people that um, that lends credibility to the idea, like Thackeray there in 2019, where he founded it in South Africa, right? And that they even found that a lot of the critical papers, if you read them correctly, the ones that actually went out and looked, because there have been people that tried to follow up and came out and said, we didn't find this, we didn't find that. But if they're, if they're read, you know, um, if they're interpreted a certain way or you look at them in a, 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 a skeptical manner, those papers, it's just, you'll find support for the theory in a certain way, that they took an interpretation of what they found that wasn't valid and if it were correctly interpreted, it would actually lend support their own data to what we're finding. So they were kind of spinning what they found to use it against us. So it's a hell of an example of live science in progress, Robbie. And if that interests you, I'm glad you're onto the case because it ain't over yet. Consider me a supporter. Ah, well, thank you, man. There's a, a you know, it's a fascinating subject. And, and sometimes the critics will even say, and this one drives me crazy see it frequently. They'll say, I wish this would, was true. It would be so interesting and such a fascinating field. And like, come on, well, then give it a fair shake. It's like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> it is. I wish it were true because it'd be so interesting. You know? And this is all available on the Cosmic Tusk website. It is. Yeah. Thank you. And that's the bibliography. We call it the bib, the permanent host page for the most comprehensive bibliography. And you can you can read every paper. It's not just a spreadsheet with names. Every single paper is available, probably some in violation of copyright, but we won't talk too much about that. <laughs> and then um, if there's an associated um, YouTube, oh, excuse me, that's um, those YouTubes where it says watch it. That's where Martin Sweatman went and did an entire YouTube on that paper. Right. So you can either read it or select ones, a hell of a lot of them. You can imagine the time that it took Martin. Martin is absolutely indefatigable Scotsman. Right. And he has did a video on each one of these papers, walking through the critics and the supportive papers and and checking out to see whether they had done a responsible job as critics or we had done a responsible job as proponents. And he takes the very strong position that that we have uh, that we've really gotten fucked on this. <laughs> yeah, to use my first curse word. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it'll keep developing. People will keep finding support every couple of years. Maybe every year comes out with this good supported paper. But what we hear is behind the scenes when they're not talking in front of a camera, when they're not making a presentation at a conference, that you know, back in the coffee room at the geology lab that they're coming around. They're not willing to say it yet, but they are very, uh, they're, 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 they're becoming more intrigued with it and more accepting of it. When that makes it into the public discourse is anyone's guess, but the trend is in the right direction. And, uh, you know, there are big things that could come out, you know, in the next few years, the Hiawatha Crater, I'll leave you with this just to give a good little follow up. I'm going to be going through your website, uh, the Cosmic Tusk. I recommend anybody out there listening, um, look at this website as well, too, and look at all the documents that you have thoroughly laid out for everyone to easily access, which I think is very, very important. But I'm going to go through them and then I want to invite you back on after I've done my own research and look through all of this, too, because Hell it, yeah. a lot of it is just the words that people use. People use words in such a way that it, it it, it sways the narrative of the public or the person reading the article in a sense. And that's how you lose out on something like this, where something that could be very, very revolutionary for all of history is just completely being sidelined all because the words they choose to clickbait an article. Yeah. Well, you know, it might take a generation and we're, we're um, 15 years into it. So I'd give another five because, you know, science advances one funeral at a time. 
And that's not always true. Look at Wally Broker right before he died as an old man in his 80s, older gentleman in his 80s. He accepted it. Right now, that's, you know, the minority of, of that class. They're going to go to their uh, graves, you know, thinking there were no catastrophes during human times. But the younger people, particularly the, the young scientists, and there are a lot of them that watch Joe Rogan, that actually had to start considering this. Right. Then they go back and hopefully go to the Cosmic Tusk or elsewhere and they read up on it and they read the critical paper and say, well, this was just a hack job. And then they read, you know, uh, one of our papers and see it's 125 pages with 50 pages of supplemental material. And we spent six years processing 5000 samples from 60 locations on four continents. And it's probably unlikely they actually accuse us of fraud, the severest critics. You know, uh, that would be a quite an elaborate fraud with no payoff <laughs> and a lot of conspiracy in our group, which now is roughly 70 people around the world, right? Uh, you know, it would be hard that we are conspiring against mainstream scientists with a bunch of bullshit or that we have misinterpreted it now for 15 straight years. Um, but when those younger folks go and look at it with a clear eye, perhaps tipped off by Rogan to the subject in general, um, they're coming along. So maybe they use their lab equipment and their paleo site to take a closer look at it. And um, that will be to our benefit. It will become increasingly accepted. I talked to a lot of archaeologists and paleontologists and geologists and basically everyone with an ist at the end of their name. But I'll be more than happy to name drop this multiple times just to get that out there. And get ready for the blowback. Right. <laughs> that some of them, even though you might like part of their research and they seem like open minded people. They might not have read the papers yet, and they will say, that, oh, I know about that. That's a bunch of bullshit. Because in 2010, 2011, they tried to shut it down. I'll give you an example. We had a beautiful PBS Nova on the subject that came out in 2009. You know, PBS Nova is the Cadillac of science TV. Doesn't get any better. And they did a wonderful one-hour episode that had our major researchers on there and the early discoveries and how we had rolled it out and the varying lines of evidence. It was just great with CGI of the mammoths and all of that. And we cheered. It's like, wow, we're just two years into this. You got major TV on PBS. It's not available for streaming anymore. The critics burned our book. They went to WGBH, protested in silence. We don't know exactly who. Gave them cold feet about our hypothesis. And the episode only lives on YouTube copyright infringements. That's the kind of games that they played to shut us down, not debate us, no dialogue, but just don't let the information be seen. So it must have been inconvenient to them. Well, George, because we're heading up on that two hour mark, where can people find the Cosmic Tusk? Um, it's just CosmicTusk.com. Um, it is. It is, and I'm very active on Twitter these days. Okay, and it's George For Howard better or Twitter. worse, would love some Twitter followers. Just crossed about 3,000, so finally kind of getting a voice in it. And got um, a good band of folks out there. It's actually a very good Twitter community on the Younger Dryas Impact. It seems like, I mean, it's a bunch of people that are all in, or at least researching the same thing. And it's not really like a huge, like giant group, but it's small enough and it kind of big enough at the same time to where you're not going to have a lot of infighting and just, you might get a bot or a troll there, but at the same time, you have a lot of people that are working towards the same goal, which I think is important. Like some communities on Twitter have just gotten so big where it's everybody fighting each other and the climate topic, you especially would think that you get a lot of traction on this as well too. Yeah, no, it's a great small community, right? Of supporters and some detractors. And, you know, that's, again, it's such a great um, search term. You know, you just go onto Twitter, search Younger Dryas, D-R-Y-A-S. You could probably just do with D-R-Y-A-S, five letters. And you're not going to get any other hints, <laughs> hits that aren't associated with our discussions. And they're probably, you know, a few thousand people that are relatively active in it. Um, I got to reach out to more it, people sharing papers sharing other speculation. There's a whole world of people that believe that there was a, well, we can talk about this next episode, but it's not really my gig, that there was a precursor civilization to this that we call Atlantis, right? I know, I know, yeah. And then, you know, it's intriguing because Plato said 9,000 years before my own time, all this went down. Well, you do the math, 
9,000 plus 2,500, you know, boom. I, I mentioned that to a person that I know who does a Plato podcast where it's all about Plato quotes and they want to entertain the idea of Atlantis being real, which I'm like, okay, that's fine. If you want to stick on yeah. the philosophy quotes, but if I want to think that there's something bigger than that and more ancient than that, I would like to go in, down into it. Well, a lot of the pushback comes because we have vitalized the Atlantis debate with Graham Hancock, you know, writes chapter after chapter on the Younger Dryas uh, in the Comet Research Group in our work, which has been wonderful. You know, Hancock has been the best thing. Hancock and Rogan and Randall Carlson, obviously, have, 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 are the best thing going in this. And we've got to, you know, give credit where credit's due there. We've been bitching and moaning about lack of attention. Well, the most popular broadcaster on earth has regular episodes on our theory. And Rogan has become increasingly educated on it. And you can't do any better than that. We just need to fill in below him a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and get it more commonly accepted. And, and a lot of that comes from the precursor civilization thing. That there, the, the, There's whole community out there that believes there was a more advanced or, you know, uh, superior than what we ever believed civilization. And then they were gifted the cataclysm part. Then we're actually publishing in big journals. You know, our papers are going into some of the best journals, thank God, right? And then those folks have some great ammo to show at least there was a cataclysm. The question being, was there a civilization before that that we don't acknowledge? And the cataclysm just wiped away evidence for them, or we haven't found the evidence because of the cataclysm, all right? And so that has uh, invigorated the Atlantis community like never before, but it ain't our gig, right? Yeah. We got to stick to our knitting, which is the, just the cataclysm. If you start getting into that, you know, it's kind of like the Carolina Bays. And we're going to talk about that next time, buddy. Well, um, I appreciate you giving me your time, George. I'm going to link all your links in the description for people to be able to click and look on it as well, too. You're welcome back on my show. I'm pretty sure right after this, we're going to set something up. Um, just give me like a week or two so I can be able to research really into this and like yeah. at least come with some questions of my own because so I can, like I said, I like to ask people and invite them on the show to be able to ask my own questions, to be able to soak up the information. But I'm going to take an ibuprofen because, dude, that was so much information. Hey! You know your stuff, man. Holy crap, Thank man. you, Robbie. No, no, that is awesome awesome man you're exactly my kind of guy and you've got some great intuition and questioning about how this stuff proceeds and i can see the frustration a little bit and and i i share that frustration so we'll <laughs> we'll continue to try to work out our anxieties over the poor state of science by talking about it yes. and, and putting the word out there and having people follow up on it and if anyone's got any questions they can get me at george at restoration and um I'm happy to answer them and be in touch. Please follow on Twitter. Um, then the Comet Research Group has a page too. It's getting a little long in the tooth, but 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 thank you. There's plenty of information out there. It's easily found. And I'll link it all in the description. And I appreciate you for doing the podcast. And thanks for listening to this episode. Out of the blank.